and the machines help us in seeing like what is most likely to come next. For example, been using Google for many years and uh, search engines and you type in something and there's an autocomplete and the autocomplete recommends you, well, what is about to come next? And here I, I type attention is a limited resource. Yes. Or attention is all you need. Or just like attention is all you need, really? Yes. That is the famous paper that then came to the logical conclusion that if it's useful to make the input longer and longer and longer, and that helps us to fine tune our predictions, why don't we just take everything as an input and feed it in at once in parallel? I mean, yeah, it, it had to, it had to go to that. It had to come to that one, right? I mean, that's, that's the logical outburst then. And that is called transformers. So these are the famous transformers that are the basis of, for example, large language model like BARD and ChatGPT. And it's actually been innovated by researchers at Google and the University of Toronto, which has always been leading in, in deep learning with, with Professor uh, Jeffrey Hinton there. And Google has pioneered it. So it, it wasn't ChatGPT and OpenAI. And they wrote this paper with a little bit tongue, tongue in cheek, attention is all you need. And that paper really blew people's mind. It got in the first five years, it has, I don't know, 75,000, 80,000 citations. That's outrageous. That's the most influential scientific works like Darwin's Origin of Species, maybe. Like that's the ballpark where it had the scientific impact it had. It was really impressive and it blew people's mind. So what, what is that about? What is attention is all you need about? Well, the attention algorithm was actually known before, well, way before. So this was published 2017 and this paper is from 2015. <laughs> Things go very fast here. So it's like, Two years before, we already knew that. And basically, well, this is one of the matrices that I showed you uh, that I showed before, like what's the probability? And you can see here when you want to predict the next word, or I think this is from a translation exercise from French to English. You can see, for example, if you have a dot, it's not clear what comes next. So there is not a clear if it would be a diagonal. There's only, okay, after this word comes this, clear. I can make a prediction here. But after a dot, I'm not sure what happens next. So the idea is then from the entire input, that you have, pay attention, pay attention to what's actually, what's actually important. So that's why attention is all, what do you need to pay attention to from the past in order to better predict the future? And that example that I use here is to complete the sentence. And since here, all the input is being fed in, in parallel, well, first of all, that gives me a lot of advantages in the computing that I can use. And second of all, I can also understand the context much better because I have, I have everything available. I have a very good memory, everything right there. But I have, the problem is what do we need to pay attention to? And what this paper basically contributed to is what they call the self-attention mechanism. So you basically pay attention to yourself, to your own input and bear with me. I will explain that. So bear with me. So for example, if I take the phrase bear with me and I put it into transformer deep neural net that transfers images that uh, computes images, for example, Dali, that's what I got bear with me. And that's what the problem of self-attention is basically about. Why did this generative AI generate an image that says, bear with me like this? Well, it's comical uh, and it's funny because it didn't have enough context. It didn't know where to put the attention. It just, I just told it, draw a bear with me. And it said like, draw a bear with me, <laughs> right? But that's not what I meant because the context here is we in a lecture. I'm explaining a concept. And so I said, bear with me. So of course, if it would have had all the context, it would have been able to put it into its place and understand the meaning of the word bear. And the meaning of the word bear can have different meanings as so many other words. For example, if the word geologist comes up and then the word rock, it probably has a different meaning than if in the vicinity or in the context of the word rock, you read about ACDC and Metallica. Then probably it's a different rock we are talking about. Or if there's dog or a tree in the vicinity of the word bark. So putting everything in at once, that's what these transformers do. And then like we also re still record the sequence. It's called the positional encoding. But basically that's the idea. And, th and that allows, for example, things and for, for these large language models to really have understanding. That's also why they have a perfect memory. That's why with a chat, a large language model chatbot, you can talk for hours and it will still remember what has been going on because it is everything available there at once. 
And that's what these large language models are actually based on, on these transformers. They feed in all the input at once. Now at the heart of it, it's still extremely important to remember what they do is these transformers, large language models, these uh, magical chatbots that we are talking with for hours, basically are programmed to predict the next, not the next word, to break the next prompt. It's kind of like a, a syllable, you could say, like a part of a word that has a meaning. And they predict just the next one of that. And, and that's what they do. And that's all they do. So that makes them sound a lot like humans because they have been fed with a lot of human data and they have a lot of degrees of freedom. So ChatGPT generation number two, ChatGPT two had 1.5 billion parameters. You can think about these neural nets and their weights. The third generation had 175 billion and ChatGPT four, a uh, thousand billion. So there's a lot of, 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 of weights and a lot of human text language that has been fed into it, terabytes of data. And that makes them then just predicting the next thing makes them sound like humans, a lot like humans. That's why they passed what's called the Turing test. And that's basically the Turing test was a challenge to see like, can we, ex couldn't we distinguish a human from a machine? Maybe just talk with it. And with these chatbots, we have proven like, no, you can just distinguish them. So they sound extremely like humans because that's what they do. They replicate, they regurgitate human language and therefore sound like a human. And therefore you feel like it's, it's, it's very human like, and therefore it's actually very human like. Now the task is not to tell you the truth. The, ta the task is what they are programmed. That's also why I extended myself explain it is to just sound like a human. And if you talk with a human, there's also no guarantee that they tell you the truth. Maybe they want to manipulate you. Maybe, maybe they don't know the truth. Maybe there's no bad intention there. Maybe they just want to be liked. Many humans want to be liked. So in that sense, it's much more likely that you fall in love with a large language model than if you, that you find the right scientific citation <laughs> that is correctly cited. Because that's not, I mean, it's, it might sound like a scientific citation, but just from the pure large language model itself, that's not the task. It's the task is to sound like you. And if you don't trust me, let's ask our large language models. So let's ask ChatGPT. Are large language models rather trained to sound like a human or to speak the truth? Large language models like ChatGPT4 are trained to generate human-like text based on the data they were trained on. Their main aim is not to speak the truth or to propagate any kind of falsehood either. No. Instead, they generate responses based on patterns they've learned during their training. So, Next time you use these chatbots to finish your homework, be aware of that. Be aware of that distinction. Now, there's much more to say about that, but we have to move on to other aspects of the digital age for now.